Welcome to Awake. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience? So for me, I drove up a mountain to pray before I got engaged. I borrowed a friend's cabin, stayed the night up there, and just set aside time to pray. Hear from God. I don't want to screw this up, right? (laughs) And I felt confirmed, like, yeah, I'm ready. This is what God has for me. Some of you have had those kind of mountaintop experiences. Maybe it was a camp. Some of you guys went on a church retreat last weekend. Anybody? There you go. There you go. Mountaintop experience, right? It's that community. It's that time away. It's that freedom from distraction. Um, I want you to go up. A, I want you to go up a mountain with me today. We're gonna just gonna set my Bible there. That's all. Uh, don't worry. I want you to go up a mountain with me and four other men. This is a mountain. It's an old mountain. It's a mountain that Jesus and his three best friends climbed 2,000 years ago. Sun is setting, reflecting off the Sea of Galilee, rose and gold color is just dominating the skyline. And four men are hiking up a mountain, escaping the world. The world is busy and hustling with all of its challenges, all of its pressures. And these three men are climbing the rocky crags of a mountain, getting away from it at all. Pretty soon, it the, the, the buzz of the world um, is beginning to drift away, and pretty soon they can't hear anything. Everything looks tiny and small down below, and the, the, the night sky is fading. The stars are beginning to just poke through the black sky, and the four of them, four of them are up there to pray. They're up there to pray, and the disciples knew that in this in this moment, their Savior was heavy. He was heavy. Just a week before, he had asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And then he followed that up with, who do you say that I am? And Peter got the right answer. He blurted out, you're the Christ, the Son of God. But since that moment, there was a heaviness about their Savior. Like he was a man carrying a huge weight upon his back, a man of sorrows, well acquainted with suffering. And so he, with his three friends, said, let's pray. Let's get up the mountain to pray. Now, if you've been an, ever out in mountain air, out in mountain air, a long hike, you're going to get tired. And the three disciples quickly fell asleep. It must have been silent and beautiful out there. And Jesus is not sleeping. He's a man pressing on. He's an athlete getting ready for this big moment, this big game. He's a warrior getting ready for the battle that's about to rage. Jesus isn't sleeping at all, but he's heavy. He's carrying some sorrow. He knew what was coming for him. After Peter said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus then responds, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be betrayed by the chief priests and the elders and the Levites and be killed, and on the third day rise. This is the first announcement that Jesus makes of his suffering. It's the first declaration of, I'm not here to be a celebrity, I'm here to die. This is about two and a half years into his public ministry, and the crowds had adored Jesus, and now they're starting to turn on him. They're starting to reject him, they're starting to plan and plot his death. And he knows it, and his face is beginning to be set towards Jerusalem. But for this night, he escapes up the mountain to shed the weight, to shed the pressure, and pray. The disciples had the sleep chased from their eyes because in that moment, a bright, shining light in the middle of the darkness woke them up, woke them right up. Like the sun was shining in all of its glory, they're awake in the middle of the night, because a bright light shines. And it says in Scripture, I'm telling this story out of Luke chapter 9, when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. When they became fully awake, they saw Jesus' glory. And it was unlike any time they had ever seen him before. I mean, these are his buddies. They'd seen him do miracles. They'd seen him interact with individuals and seen him interact with crowds, seen him preach the Sermon on the Mount, watched him walk on water. And all of a sudden, this is different. It's clearly him, but he's different. 
It says that his clothes were a dazzling white as no one could bleach them. It, they were shimmering like lightning every time he moved. He's just, his, his clothes are radiant and his face is shining brighter than the sun. Talk about Moses coming down from the mountain and his face is gleaming. They had to put a veil over it. Those of you who've read the Old Testament, you know that story. This is Jesus in his glory, no veil, shining. And these guys are stunned. Three fishermen from Galilee are witnessing the glory of the Son of God up on a mountain after they'd fallen asleep. But Jesus wasn't the only one that they saw up on that mountain. There were two others with him. You remember the story? They looked and it was Moses and Elijah with him. And it says that they appeared with Jesus in glory. This wasn't Moses and Elijah just, you know, in their old duds. <laughs> they were shining like Jesus. Now, for those of you who don't know, Moses and Elijah lived hundreds of years before this moment, right? 800 years, 1,400 years, something like that for these two men. Moses died. Elijah was taken directly up into heaven. And here they get a glimpse of Moses and Elijah 800 years, 1,400 years after their decease, right? In glory with Jesus. And these men just are, they're beside themselves. Peter blurts out, Lord, it's, it's good that we're here. Let us, um, uh, let's see, I got an idea. Yeah, we, want, we don't want this to end. This is really cool. So we're going to make three tents and you guys can just hang out and we'll just freeze this moment in time. How's that, Jesus? I don't want this to end. That's a mountaintop experience. And in that moment, Peter's voice is interrupted by a bright shining cloud that comes and overshadows them. And they can no longer see each other. They can no longer see Moses and Elijah. They can no longer see Jesus. A bright shining cloud in the middle of the darkness overshadows them and they hit the deck, it tells us. They fall to their faces to the ground. They're trembling in terror and fear. They hear a voice, not Jesus' voice, not Moses' voice, not Elijah's voice. They're on their faces and they hear a voice that says, this is my chosen one. Listen to him. One sentence, one voice, that's what they got. The voice of power, the voice of authority, the voice of God speaks out of this cloud and validates Jesus. He's not Moses and Elijah. He's not one of the prophets. He's not, you know, a good religious teacher. He's not a prophet. He's not a good example. This is my chosen one. I'm going to put my stamp on him, my seal on him, my validation on him, my recommendation. This is my chosen one, my son. Listen to him. That's it. They got one sentence of the voice of God. And God speaks that one sentence to us today in much the same way. Jesus is the chosen one of God. Listen to him. Let his words be more powerful to you than any words that have ever been spoken over your lives. Any positive encouragement, any negative criticism, anyone who's cut you down, anyone who's built you up, the words of Jesus, the Father is saying, listen to him. Listen to him. Focus on him more than Moses and the law and even the prophets. Listen to my son, Jesus. I'm giving you this vision of glory. And they lay there trembling on their faces until Jesus walks over to them, touches them, puts strength back in their bodies and says, rise, have no fear. They were totally afraid. And the Son of God, who's now validated by the Father, says, rise. Have no fear. Maybe that's a word for some of you today. Have no fear. Rise. The Son of God is here. Have no fear. When Jesus says that to them, they look up. They look up and the cloud is gone. And Moses and Elijah are gone. The bright shining light and this radiant view of Jesus is gone. All that they were left with was the, the darkness of that night and the silence of the mountain. But this light had shone and it had shone in their hearts and was shining still. 
we got to see this curtain between heaven and earth lifted. For a moment, the curtain comes up and we peer into this land called forever. We get this unique glimpse of who God is. We get this unique glimpse of what awaits us. And the curtain drops again. And just as soon as it came up, it came down again. This view of glory, it says, I love that, it just landed on me. When they became fully awake, they saw his glory. God wants to wake us up to see his glory. He wants to wake us up to see his glory. And he wants to wake us up in seeing Jesus' glory to also see our glory. Let me speak to you about this for a minute because this has been internally, for probably a year, I've been wrestling this with my guys. Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus in glory. What is that? What is that? And why? Why did they, why was it not enough for Jesus in this moment to have the Father say, hey, you're my chosen one. I know you just said you're going to suffer and die. Yes, that's going to happen. I love you. I'm with you. I'm for you. Why is that not enough? Why do Moses and Elijah show up as well? And why do they show up in glory? And why is this story in Scripture? Because what Jesus says to them after this is don't tell anybody for a while. I got to reveal myself when I'm, with, when I'm good and ready. After I'm, I'm resurrected, then you can tell people. So these three men get this quick glimpse of the curtain lifting in a land called forever. It comes down again. What's it all for? Here's what it's for. In Romans chapter 8, verse 30, it says that all those whom God predestined, he called. All those he called, he justified. And all those he justified will be, do you know the end of this? Glorified. They will be glorified. There's an end to your salvation and it's not forgiveness. There's an end point to your salvation and it's not just that you are now clean before God which you are clean before God. There's an end to your salvation, and it's not just that you get to go to heaven one day because of what Jesus did for you. There's an end to our salvation that's called glory. It's called glory. We've not talked about this. We've not thought about this. I've never heard a sermon on this. I've, I was actually asked to preach a sermon on this, and I'm like, I don't know what to say, like three years ago. Now I know what to say. <laughs> now I know what to say. The end of our salvation is glory. God doesn't just wipe away your sins and go, okay, you're kind of, I took you from negative 100 to zero, and now it's your job to get to positive. No, God says all those he justified will be glorified. What does that look like? It looks like Moses and Elijah. What it says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, all those who turn many to righteousness, they will shine like the stars forever and ever. Your destiny in Christ is to shine. It's to radiate the light and goodness and glory of God, and this is what you will do forever, not just for now. C.S. Lewis, in this little book called The Weight of Glory, little essay, he says, there are no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. That every person you've ever encountered is on one of two trajectories. They, would, they are becoming someone who, if you saw them in eternity, you would be tempted to fall down and worship them. Or they're on a trajectory away from God and away from his glory into darkness, destruction, and evil, something worse than your worst nightmare. But there are no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. We are on one of two paths, and for the Christian who's put their faith in Jesus Christ, the end of that path is glory. It's glory. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a professional athlete. Anybody feel me on that? Okay, like five, ten of us? Cool. So I wanted to be a professional athlete. First, it was baseball, right? I was just a huge baseball fan. And then transitioned to basketball, and I, I look back on that, and for me, I was chasing the highest glory I could see. The highest potential glory was a trophy, wealth, fame, crowds, applause, approval, notoriety, right? And even as a young boy, I was, I was moving towards it. I was magnetically being pulled towards the highest glory I could see. And let me just say to you, you are too. You're a glory chaser. It's how God has made you. The highest glory you see is what you are chasing. And let me say that to you, even as a Christian. Even as a Christian, 
You can say, I'm living for Jesus, I love God, I'm, you know, I want to serve his kingdom, but the highest glory in your goals is to have a billion dollars in wealth management. You, you want a billion dollars under management because that's glory to you. That's making it, that's success, that's a validation for who you are. Or you want your startup to go public, right? You want that invention that you started, that company that you started to explode into glory, right? You, you're chasing something. That's why you're here. God made you to chase glory, and you are going to do it. You already are, and so am I. And what I see here in Scripture and what I want to present to you today is this idea of the glory of God being what you were made to chase. All other glories will not satisfy Scripture talks about money being a glory, Psalm 50, 49, 50. It talks about this, this glory of money and wealth, and it says, at death, it fails you. <laughs> There's a glory to it. There is. Let's own it. Let's admit it, that with wealth comes glory. With fame comes glory. With success comes glory. Was Steve Jobs glorified? Yes, he was, right? You know, on earth, was, were people treating him like a glorious figure? Yes. I heard they had a worship service at Apple when he died. They actually rolled down the banners off these big walls, and there was a worship service in glorifying man. There, you know, the Bible says there's a glory to being praised by men. There's a glory that comes with approval. There's a glory that comes with honor. There's a glory that comes with respect. And many of us are chasing that approval. Maybe it's your parents' approval. Maybe it's your boss's approval. Maybe it's some other approval of someone in your life. You really want them to be pleased with you. But there's a glory to that, the glory of men. There's a glory of women. Actually, Scripture says that women's long hair is their glory, right? <laughs> there's a glory to women. Why are most men chasing women? Because they're glorious. Because <laughs> they're glorious. You women are glorious and a very good gift from God to those of us who need tons of help. Right? <laughs> There's a good glory to that, but it's not the ultimate glory that you were made for. If you're chasing relationships and success and money as the top of the glory ceiling, you're settling. You're settling. God has made you for a bigger and a higher glory, and one day you will get there in Christ, is what I'm saying to you. So why not start that party now? Why not start the party now of living for the glory that comes from God that he is giving to us? There was a, um, let me back up. This glory needed to be purchased. It needed to be purchased. That's why when Jesus goes up the mountain of transfiguration and his glory is revealed, Moses and Elijah were with him. Why? Why were they with him? I wrestled through this, looked up tons of books and commentaries on this. Here's the best explanation I've seen. When his soul was sinking under the weight of knowing, I'm going to be rejected by those who love me the most. I'm going to be rejected by the leaders of these people. I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. And I'm going to wear, uh, bear the full weight of the wrath of God, worse than crucifixion. Many others have been crucified, but Jesus uniquely was going to bear the wrath of God for the sins of our world, for my sins and your sins. Imagine the weight of knowing that, knowing the almighty power of God like he did, knowing God so intimately like he did, knowing the anger of God against sin like he did, and knowing our God doesn't just sidestep sin and ignore it, he confronts it head on, and here Jesus is up on the mountain confronting sin head on, and it's weighty on him. And God blesses him with a vision of the glory of why he's doing it. He's doing it because Moses and Elijah are the friends of God. God talked with Moses face to face up the mountain. God loved Moses and he loved Elijah so much he said, you're not dying. Yeah, that whole dying thing. I'm going to rescue you up. I'm going to escape you as one of two men in scripture who never died. Jesus himself died. But Jesus here going to the cross, setting his face toward Jerusalem, knowing it was going to be nine months tops before he was going to be crucified and bear the wrath of God, gets a future foretaste of glory. He sees, I'm doing this to purchase their glory. 
I'm doing it so that all those who are justified will be glorified. If I don't go to the cross, my buddies Moses and Elijah are not going to reflect the glory of God as they were made to do. We don't automatically get there. That glory needs to be purchased. And Jesus knows that, and the Father knows that, and blesses him with this vision of Elijah and Moses to say, son, 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 the reward, the reward of redeeming people to be as they were meant to be, glorifying me and reflecting it like Moses and Elijah are right now, that's why you're doing this. That's why you're going to carry this weight. That's why it's going to hurt, but you're going to keep going. That's why you're never going to call for angels to rescue you from the cross. That's why you're never going to stop, but on the cross say, Father, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, that they might be glorified with me in eternity one day. Jesus gets this vision of, the, of the, his glory and the glory that he's purchasing for his people. And his soul is strengthened. And he goes down the hill not as a man of sorrows, as a a warrior and a king ready to conquer. He's strong now. He's powerful now. The Father has affirmed him and he's seen the vision of glory. This is why why Moses and Elijah were there. That's your future. Can I just speak that to you? That's your destiny. All other glories you chase, you'll settle. What I want to say to you in this is that your glory is not up for grabs anymore. It's not based on your performance anymore. It's not based on you earning it anymore. It's not based on you pleasing someone anymore. It's not based on you finding the right wife or the right husband anymore to fully satisfy you with the glory that you're aiming for. Your glory is totally secure in Jesus on the cross and rising from death. Whatever other glory you chase and I chase is settling. It's settling because God has purchased it. You could not have more security than all those he justified he glorified. It's not he might glorify, he may glorify, he could possibly glorify. All those he justified will be glorified. He glorified. This is your future. This is your identity in Christ now. You're not a, you're not a glory chaser here. You're a glory chaser here. You know, three nights ago, there was a glory story that captured America. Do you know what I'm talking about? Some of you baseball fans, you know what I'm talking about. Three nights ago, two cities haven't had glory in 70 years or 100 and somebody. Thank you. You you guys know what I'm talking about. 70 years or 108 years. Which city is going to get the glory? This is the storyline. This is the big news. What what was intriguing to me, Cubs down 3-1. The threat of them not getting glory was huge. I mean, if you're anybody a Cubs fan here, okay, you were bummed at 3-1, let's admit it, right? You didn't think it was going to happen. You thought 3-1, okay, it has happened. I'm probably not believing that it will. I hope it will, but it's not going to happen. Except they won game five. They dominated. And then they won game six. And all of a sudden, Chicago's starting to believe. But you're still playing on the road in Cleveland, and it's not... The Cubs off to a good start, 1-0, home run, first batter. Yes, our glory, it's, it's going to be secure. We're going to get there. They rally, rally. You guys stayed up late watching this, right? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Ninth inning, tie game, 6-6. Six to six. They go seven games, and they're tied after the ninth inning, which you know, it's a, I mean, that's amazing, right? And all of a sudden, then the rain comes in. Let's just pause the drama for 17 minutes, right? Like, if we couldn't get any more dramatic, let's just have the rain come right now for 17 minutes. So they go to their locker rooms. Cubs uh, veteran Jason Hayward calls a team meeting. Come back out. Cubs crush it. Two, two runs in the top of the 10th. Indians go home. Cubs jump and hug each other like they've been, you know, long lost brothers or something, in the center of the field, and, and Chicago gets glory. They interviewed Jason Hayward right after the game. You saw this. And they said, okay, so you called the team meeting. You called the team meeting, and, and what'd you say? You know what he said? He said, I just needed to remind them who they are. They needed to know who they are. I didn't tell them anything new. They needed to know who they are. We've overcome every obstacle. We shouldn't be here. I told them who they are. 
This is our team meeting. Some of you are in the bottom of the ninth. Some of you are in the midst of a rainstorm. Some of you are wondering, is this job going to work out? Is this life going to work out? Is Silicon Valley going to work out? What am I doing? Because it's not feeling like winning right now. (laughs) And then the rain comes. Let me call a team meeting. Can I just call a team meeting and say, who you are is you were made for glory. You were made for glory that you can't get to through a, through, on your own efforts. But in Jesus Christ, it's totally secure. Victory is certain. We win. We know the end of the story. And those of us with Jesus enjoy him forever in glory. That's who you are. That's who you are. Go play the top of the 10th, right? Go play the top of the 10th. I want you to live for the glory of God because that is what you were made for and I want you to live for your glory in God because that is certain in Christ. Don't settle. Don't buy some cheap identity. Don't chase some false version of you. Who you are is made for glory in Christ and is totally secure. Live in that identity. Jesus, that's why he died for you. He purchased it. He loves you and it's certain you're made for glory. Jesus, thank you. If this is our team meeting, speak over us our true identity in you. Speak over us the words we need to hear in our very individual lives and circumstances. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But in Jesus, all those who are justified will be glorified. And we will enjoy you and celebrate you and reflect your glory as bright shining lights forever. Help us live into this, Jesus. Help us live into this in a world that chases money and relationships and success and so many other glories. Let those other glories fall away from us today, fall off of us today. And would you set our faces again to pursue the one and only glory that comes from God. In his name we pray, amen.